The next speaker is Dr. Mandit Muira from uh, Boston, USA, and Dr. Mandit speaks about COVID-19 illness in native and immunosuppressed states. Mandit, what do you want? Oh, thank you. Okay. Thank you so very much. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Can you can you hear me clearly? Yes. 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 Okay. Coming. Good. Well, uh, uh, thank you. Thank no? you so very much for yes, the coming, opportunity. Yes, coming, coming. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. It is. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. It's not a problem. Okay. Great. Great. I great. Great. I, I'm sorry, there's a lot of lot of noise. Okay. Um, so first of all, uh, thank you so very much for having me speak to you all. And, and at the outset, I want to be sure uh, that I uh, first give you a shout out for uh, all of the frontline activity that each of my uh, brothers and sisters in Spain are doing. Uh, I know that uh, you have uh, really, really been uh, stressed, uh, strained uh, with uh, this situation as we are being now confronted in the United States in particular regions like uh, New York City. Luckily, this hasn't yet um, uh, assaulted us in the manner in which it has New York City in Boston. Uh, but I do, um, um, I do uh, wish you all well and thank you so much for being in the front lines well before us. Now, the way in which I have been conceptualizing the syndrome of COVID-19 is to think of it in terms of stages of clinical disease. And uh, as, as I have uh, curated the literature, it has become very clear that there are three very clear and very distinct stages of this disease. The, the first uh, stage of early infection, the second stage, which is a pulmonary phase, and the third, a phase of hyperinflammation. And it is, in, in fact, uh, during uh, these stages in the later half of the pulmonary stage, which I refer to as, as stage 2B, uh, and the hyperinflammation stage 3, where the greatest risk of mortality is. Now, what differentiates these two particular stages, in my viewpoint, uh, is the fact that during the early stages, stage one and early stage two, the viral replication is the predominant uh, factor. And in stage two B through stage three, the viral replication phase starts to uh, uh, dissipate a bit. And in fact, it's overtaken by a host inflammatory response uh, phase, uh, which um, uh, is what ultimately determines the mortality of patients. Why this construct is important is that even if we throw medications at patients with COVID-19, if we don't apply the medications at the right stage of the disease, the likelihood of either preventing transition to a greater stage or the likelihood of preventing a deterioration or a disaster starts to become very limited. For example, we'll discuss this uh, as we move on, uh, but if you start using corticosteroids in stage one, it would be rather deleterious. On the other hand, if you do not use uh, corticosteroids in stage three, you may not be able to save the patient. So these things have to be kept in mind. And therefore, blanket statements that I hear very often about, well, you know, absolutely no corticosteroids in COVID-19 uh, somewhat strike me as uh, dissonant in this uh, situation. Now, most of us here are aware of how this particular virus strikes uh, the human body. And uh, it is important to recognize that the uh, uh, glycoprotein spike of the uh, crown of this virus really inter interacts with the ACE2 receptor on type 2 pneumocytes predominantly, and is then, uh, and, uh, through endocytosis, um, uh, begins to downregulate ACE2. ACE2 is a very, very important counter-regulatory RAS uh, activity, uh, neurohormone, if you will, uh, which in fact works uh, through angiotensin 1-7 and MOS receptors to create vasodilation, anti-growth, and anti-fibrotic activity. 
This is a counter-regulatory system to the traditional angiotensin II system. And when ACE2 levels are decreased, as they are in the presence of um, uh, COVID-19 in the lung, uh, what happens is that there's unopposed angiotensin II and the uh, injury to the pneumocyte is set in place. It is perhaps very important for us to understand the concept of protective versus pathogenic inflammation in this um, uh, situation and to understand how these pathways actually intersect. So when a virus enters the human body, uh, there is first a very robust early interferon response. And this interferon response really pushes um, uh, the viral replication down and is the first order, it's the first soldier in the human body that basically pushes uh, the viral attack away. Uh, it recognizes uh, pathogenic uh, patterns, if you will, called PAMPs, which are pathogenic um, patterns of molecular signaling uh, that basically determine uh, this early interferon response, which is interferon type 1 and type 2, 3. Uh, these are alpha, beta, and gamma interferon. And then uh, as the interferon cascade uh, pushes out, there's an inflammatory reaction which starts to get set. And that inflammatory reaction is really designed to exercise repair and repel any further injury, uh, if uh, you will. One of the most interesting uh, data points with uh, COVID-19 that has just started to emerge is that this particular virus does not allow uh, for a robust early interferon response. And that this is why its pathogenicity, particularly in those who are immunocompromised or particularly those who are elderly and frail, tends to be much, much higher. And it's really because of this lack of interferon uh, response in the initial stages. Now, what happens is that if, if this protective uh, infl uh, inflammatory cascade is disturbed, uh, then a pathologic dysregulated inflammatory cascade becomes uh, set in the situation. And as a result of which, most of the damage that we see as ARDS uh, or perhaps, as we'll talk about in a moment, on the heart, um, uh, which is another very important therapeutic uh, target for us uh, moving on with this disease, becomes manifest. Now, I'd like to draw your attention to one of the most important proteases, which is ADAM17, and its important signaling. ADAM17, as a protease, uh, interacts with ACE2 in a way that it, in fact, is the determinant of how this hyperinflammatory response gets set. So ADAM17 is also a recruiter of cytokines and is actually a TNF-alpha activator and an IL-6 activator. And one of the things that happens in this uh, particular situation is that the virus attacks the ACE2, depresses ACE2 levels, angiotensin II then starts to become overwhelming with vasoconstriction and its uh, pro-growth and pro-fibrotic stages. And then ADAM17 becomes aberrant and starts to uh, create a release of cytokines, which in fact then um, upregulate and cause this uh, cytokine storm in later stages, which we call hyperinflammation. So if you were to really now think through this, uh, you realize that what happens is the virus comes in and in 80% of uh, patients, the interferon um, uh, uh, ability is strong and it pushes the virus away. And then we basically have a situation where in the few uh, where it transitions into the pulmonary phase, it moves into uh, a phase of um, uh, pulmonary disease in concert with a host inflammatory response that then triggers uh, the uh, end stages and multi-system organ failure. Now you will hear more about the clinical symptoms and how patients present, and I don't wish to go into that in detail, nor do I wish to go over the clinical signs in this situation, but to point out to you uh, some simple things that you can use, and then I'll share with you some uh, very quick data on the patterns and temporal trends that uh, we have been observing very carefully. Uh, so first of all, of course, the earliest uh, dysregulation occurs at the T cell level, and that's why you see lymphopenia with this particular virus. It's not unique to this virus. Many other viruses, RSV, others also do this. Um, and we see that even in immunosuppressed patients like transplant patients 
who actually have a lymphopenia as a result of exposure to immunosuppression. So this is not a very specific marker, but it is a very commonly observed marker. And as you then uh, tend to go into this uh, stage, you start to see elevations in CRP and, and lactate dehydrogenase levels and IL-6 and D-dimers and ferritin and troponin and even NT-proBNP, which is a very good marker for cardiac stress and strain. And we'll discuss uh, those markers and their patterns in a moment. And that's how you then create a schematic for how potential therapies can be applied, whether it's antiviral therapy or uh, how you think about um, uh, immunotherapy in this situation. Of course, in the early viral phase, you want to reduce immunosuppression, you want to avoid corticosteroids, but in the late and uh, mid phases of inflammation, you want to really apply the therapies that uh, uh, Professor Miro uh, just spoke about, which I listened to in such an elegant um, uh, talk that he gave uh, with um, the use of drugs like tocilizumab. Now, when you look at these biomarkers, there are some very interesting aspects of these biomarkers. The first is, I'd like to draw your attention to the coagulation biomarker, D-dimer. When you look at D-dimers, D-dimers start to uh, get elevated by about a week of the infection. And in those who are unlikely to survive, uh, this biomarker keeps on increasing. And our general rule of thumb here at Harvard is that if uh, this biomarker crosses about 1,000, uh, one needs to really start paying uh, very close attention. It means that there's a very high chance that there's microvascular thrombosis that's occurring in these patients. And in some cases, we advocate for the selective use of um, drugs that address the coagulation pathway, such as uh, unfractionated uh, heparin in some cases. Uh, when you start to then examine uh, uh, the other biomarkers, say cardiac troponin, for instance, you notice that there is a mild rise in troponin early, but it's not until about the 10th or 12th day that is into the course of this illness, well into the mid course of this illness, that we start to see the rise in cardiac troponins. And there are now several reports that have suggested that when troponin rises above a certain threshold, let's say about 38 in uh, the case of troponin I, uh, that this in fact confers a very, very negative uh, prognosis uh, to these patients. Let's then look at uh, the other biomarkers. And if you look at interleukin-6, serum ferritin, and lactate dehydrogenase, a very interesting factor becomes uh, evident. The first is that these are markers that get elevated rather early. So you see the differences emerging even early. And in particular, ferritin as an acute phase reactant is a very, very good biomarker. And you notice that the average um, uh, ferritin, even by day four in patients who were likely to not survive the episode, was close to 1,000. So whenever this level hits above 500 in our uh, patient uh, cases, we become extremely careful and extremely concerned about that patient. And we try uh, to ensure uh, that, uh, that we are following uh, the non-viral associated hyperinflammatory pathways very closely uh, for these uh, patients. And these, these sort of tidbits and pearls in terms of the time trends of these biomarkers are very, very important to keep in mind. Why is that important? The reason it's important is that um, it's not just the sepsis and the respiratory failure and the ARDS and the mechanical ventilation that kill people. When you start to look at uh, people who did not survive, uh, about half of them uh, have um, the, at least the syndrome of de novo worsening or new onset heart failure, about half of them. You look at coagulopathy and evidence of acute cardiac injury, and over half of the non-survivors will have evidence of that, suggesting that these are potentially pathways that we should keep in mind as being very critical and, and pick them up quickly. For example, cardiac dysfunction can be picked up not only by the acute cardiac injury, but also by the evidence of elevation in NT pro, uh, pro BNP biomarkers. And it turns out that if you look at the cause of death, what actually terminally killed the patient, even though they were mechanically ventilated and they were in respiratory failure, about a third of these deaths are cardiac in origin, suggesting uh, that uh, close attention to what's happening with the heart uh, during this time is critical. It's not just the lung, it's not just the mechanical ventilation. 
And there are at least four distinct types of cardiovascular complications that have been noted uh, from the current uh, uh, literature to date, acute cardiac injury, heart failure and cardiogenic shock, arrhythmias, and as I pointed out to you, venous thromboembolism, which uh, is a theoretical risk. Its incidence is unknown, but certainly microvascular dysfunction is very, very important. There have been cases surfacing now about um, uh, uh, the description of fulminant myocarditis and what does that mean and how these are treated aggressively with corticosteroids and with intravenous immunoglobulin. And in general, these are not biopsy-proven cases of myocarditis. These are cases of acute cardiac dysfunction. And our feeling is that many of these cases are very, very related to what we observe with CAR-T therapy for cancer treatment, where you have this uh, cytokine storm and almost a hemophagocytic uh, um, a syndrome that in fact consumes uh, the systems and causes acute cardiac depression. Uh, we have actually uh, done an MRI on a patient um, very early in the course as the troponin started to rise. And we saw that the echocardiogram looked completely normal, but when we did the uh, MRI, we saw a significant uh, myocardial edema suggesting the evidence and, and presence of myocardial injury. And we are seeing many of these patients in New York are presenting with ST segment elevations at the time of their acute illness. And um, people are mistakenly thinking of them as coronary thrombotic events when in fact uh, these may in fact represent cardiac dysfunction from uh, this very fulminant cytokine storm. Why am I uh, saying that this is not necessarily the true form of lymphocytic myocarditis? On the right panel, you see uh, uh, in the rare case where we do have pathology samples in these cases, um, um, uh, because most of these patients tend to, if they die, they tend not to go to autopsy. They tend to actually be moved away for cremation or to a morgue very quickly because of the um, uh, problems that we have with storage, etc. And what they've noticed is very, very little my, uh, myocyte infiltration with lymphocytes, and it's very sparse, but there's a lot of necrosis, there's a lot of edema, and it suggests that much of what we are observing is a cytokine storm. So these are really outlined for you as the mechanisms for cardiac involvement. There's direct viral toxicity, of course, but it's rare. There's microvascular disease, which is common. There's hypoxia-induced myocardial injury. Of course, um, when patients become hypoxic, the heart doesn't work well. Uh, and when you, you can actually exacerbate subclinical diastolic dysfunction in these hearts, and it's very, very common. That's why the elderly patients with hypertension and diabetes who come in, uh, they are often sometimes given fluid resuscitation. They're placed on ventilators um, and their heart is strained. And in this situation, uh, one can in fact, even a compensated state of diastolic heart failure can become uh, decompensated very quickly. Um, we also have a situation of a Takotsubo type uh, presentation where the acute catecholamine stress of being intubated, of uh, the hypoxia, of the critical illness itself can cause temporary myocardial damage. And then there's what I think is uh, in the late stages, the reason why these patients die is the systemic inflammatory response syndrome related uh, cardiomyopathy. So if I were to just summarize for you just a few basic concepts. Uh, first, uh, effective therapy against COVID-19 illness will require a multifaceted approach. It's not going to be just one or the other. The second is that you must know at what time point to apply what therapy appropriately. Uh, the pathophysiology is clearly related to a direct viral insult but then it's overtaken in the late stages by a misdirected and uncontrolled immune response that causes uh, what we now know to be the reason for death. And the development of heart failure in this syndrome should not be underappreciated. It is in fact very akin to what has been observed with CAR-T uh, therapy. And we are seeing this very, very often, which is why I'm an advocate for the earlier use of uh, certain therapies. Now, there has been a lot of talk about ACE inhibitors and ARBs, and some people have advocated, oh my goodness, because this virus goes through the ACE2 uh, receptor, you should stop ACE inhibitors or ARBs. I will tell you that that's a very, very wrong thing to do. I would uh, caution you strongly against that. And in fact, uh, there will be data um, uh, in support of my statement coming out early uh, next week. 
um, on this issue. Very, very important data uh, that's uh, coming out from a large series of patients. Uh, and the next point I would make is about statins. You know, uh, statins might actually be very, very good drugs. They they have pleiotropic effects that are anti-inflammatory, and these drugs, in fact, uh, can also inhibit natural killer cell cytotoxicity, uh, which uh, uh, there is, in fact, some support for the use of high-dose statins with a torvastatin in sepsis syndrome. And there is now a clinical trial that has just uh, started in Canada uh, looking at colchicine by the same investigators who investigated colchicine in the post-myocardial infarction trial era. And they're looking at um, using colchicine as an anti-inflammatory uh, during this uh, situation. Whether it has uh, any merit, I do not know. But certainly, uh, these are very interesting lines of therapeutic uh, implementation that one can keep in mind. So to summarize for you as I end this conversation with you uh, is to remind you uh, that this is a two-phase, um, uh, two-pathogenic uh, phase disease. Um, it is actually divided into three stages, uh, of which the central stage is a mild to a moderate to severe stage, which is 2A and 2B, and that you need to apply the therapies at the right time in these patients. And in order to do that, you need to understand the pattern of biomarkers, as well as the engagement of other organs, such as the heart. And these are the key points that I want to make for you. I'll end by uh, showing you this particular uh, portrait, which was made by Edward Munch in 1919, you will understand uh, why that date is important because the first um, uh, flu pandemic of 1918 occurred. Edward Munch was a Norwegian uh, painter who painted himself, actually, and you can see um, how it shows uh, very nicely his bed in the background, his robe, his very sallow um, and very uh, pale looking appearance, very cathectic looking appearance, and he was afflicted uh, with the flu at that time point, and he subsequently died of it, but was a uh, survivor, if you will, of the acute phase of this. And it also shows uh, the social isolation and the loneliness that uh, people are experiencing as a result of this. And uh, I cannot thank you all enough uh, for fighting this very important fight with us all. And thank you so very much for your attention, and I'm available to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Dr. Mira, for your excellent presentation. Uh, we have a uh, we have a, a, a lot of questions. Eh? I select two or three important questions. The, the, the first question is, is about the pathogenicity of the virus. Uh, uh, is there any role of antibody dependent enhancement of infection on pulmonary pathogenesis, especially in the week of the disease? Yeah, you mean, uh, you, uh, if you can just clarify that question, you mean that um, uh, antibodies to the virus that then cause the ARDS? Is that the question? Exactly. Yes. So, yes, yes. So I think the answer is that, that is we just question. simply do not... Yes. Yeah, we, we, we just simply do not know that at this time point. And as best as we can tell, the antibody responses to this virus um, tend to take some time. So in the, in the data that we are observing, and particularly when you look at convalescent uh, sera uh, that's being obtained from people who have recovered from the virus, the antibody response to this virus is, uh, is a late phenomenon for one reason or another. And so I doubt if, uh, if the ARDS is an antibody-mediated um, uh, component uh, of the injury. I think it is very much the withdrawal of anti-inflammatory uh, pathways such as ACE2 in concert with the activation of cytokines, which then um, uh, create this uh, problem. Uh, thank you, Mandy. Uh, another, another question. Uh, would you recommend anticoagulation for patients with COVID due to theoretical risk of thrombotic events? Yes. Um, uh, our, our current uh, protocol um, at, at Harvard is to uh, strongly consider anticoagulation early if you see a rise in troponin, uh, 
or you see a rise in D-dimers in these patients. Um, usually if the D-dimer crosses a threshold of 1,000 nanograms per ml, uh, and uh, we start to see even a little rise in an in intraponin, we then uh, strongly advocate that if there's no contraindication, you should consider um, unfractionated heparin. Uh, Mandy, uh, another question. Has ferritin been identified uh, uh, as a possible indicator of hyperinflammation phase? Yes. So um, I think that uh, what we see is ferritin tends to start to rise very early in the syndrome. And when the ferritin crosses about 500, um, the chance that that patient is going to develop severe disease and in fact move into stage 2B disease, which is which is uh, develop mild ARDS and potentially get intubated, uh, rises very very uh, strongly. And so it's a uh, you know in many ways ferritin is a non-specific biomarker, and you say you know you see its elevation in lots of um, critical illness conditions. But in this case, there's actually what appears to be almost a linear response, and it's a very early biomarker. So if uh, ferritin increases by, uh, beyond 500, I get very, very scared about that patient. Okay, uh, I have a lot question for you. Uh, based on your coming of lack of, of interferon responding early, do you, do you do you hear me? Yes, I repeat I can. the question. Based on your comment of lack, yes, your yes. based on your comment of lack of in response in early stage in immunosuppressed, then could it be a good therapeutic option? Yes. Interferon beta. Yes, absolutely. Uh, what a great uh, question. And in fact, um, in fact, uh, there are some studies that are now advocating testing uh, the use of interferon. The key with interferon application is, is to use it in the earlier phase. Because if, um, if, if you actually have allowed the uh, cytokine release to ADAM17, uh, et cetera, to occur, it becomes very, very difficult at that uh, stage to uh, have a therapeutic effect. Interferon's uh, therapeutic effect will be very much in the early stages. And I actually strongly would advocate studies in that uh, direction. OK. Thank you, Mandy, for your uh, response to the question. OK, thank you. Thank you. Uh